Mr. Stout. Thank you, David Roberts. Good evening, friends of liberty. We Americans are lucky. We still have a Fourth of July and Independence Day. Whether we shall still have one next year or five years from now depends on us. And whether France shall again have a 14th of July, a Bastille Day, that too in large measure depends on us. It also depends on Britain and, of course, on the French people themselves. Do they still want a Bastille Day? Are they still, most of them, friends of liberty? We not only would like to know that, we need to know it. And there is no one better qualified to tell us than our guest this evening, Eve Cooney. Miss Cooney first became widely known in America by the publication of her biography of her famous mother, Marie Cooney. Recently, he, she has gained new distinction as a speaker and writer on European events. If anyone can tell us about France, she can. You frighten me very much, Mr. Stout. I claim no exclusive knowledge or insight. If not exclusive, Miss Cooney, then at least exceptional. And I'll start by asking, not for a revelation, but an opinion about Germany's invasion of Russia. What do you think, what effect do you think that is having on the people of France? Well, the French people are, of course, being submerged by an intense German and pro-German propaganda lauding Hitler's crusade against Bolshevism. Whatever the attitude of the Vichy government may be, this propaganda has little chance of fooling the people of France for the very simple reason that the conquerors who occupy, oppress, and loot 14 European countries, including France, happen to be the Nazis, not the Russians. You see, the French have a dreadfully direct knowledge of who their enemy is. Every resistance to Hitler, every blow struck at Hitler, from whatever side they come, even from the much-hated Bolshevist side, is a gain for the French, because it may bring nearer the crushing of Nazi Germany. Well, if the, Rus if the German campaign should run into difficulties in Russia, do you think there's a chance of an uprising in France? You mean an uprising against the German army of occupation? Frankly, I do not think that this is a practical possibility as long as the balance of forces in the occupied territories is overwhelmingly in favor of the Nazis. We cannot think in terms of a revolution in the old sense against the modern weapons of the conquerors. No, I didn't mean cobblestone barricades. However strong your heart is, you can't fight tanks and airplanes with pitchforks. That's it. Not unless you receive from the outside the immediate help of a powerful ally. But the British are not yet able to support efficiently an active resistance on French soil. Only moral resistance, passive resistance, are possible in our country today. They already exist. Every letter we receive from France tells us that. Do you get many letters? I receive a few, but what I was really speaking of is the very heavy mail addressed to the free French organizations abroad and also to the radio stations of England and America. This very numerous and moving letters from the captive French people are profoundly revealing. The French, like every other nation, have made mistakes. They know that. But they have not lost their hope and their courage. They are more and more determined that the future will see France free, united, and strong again. Well, certainly they had no monopoly on mistakes. What were, in your opinion, the most important factors in the French defeat? First of all, of course, was the tragic contrast between the military weakness of France and the military strength of the Nazis. But then, why was France weak? I think that all the French can democratically share the responsibility for the weakness of their democracy. The military leaders did not prepare a modern army. The political leaders did not sufficiently warn the country of the danger she was in. The employers and the workers were both selfish. Both fought for their class interests at the expense of production. And when everybody realized the situation, it was too late. It seems to me that what we all lack on both sides of the Atlantic is the notion of speed and of the timing of events. For instance, it requires years to build up a modern defense of a country. But not until an emergency is directly at hand can you get a parliamentary body to vote funds for building up these defenses. Well, there's no help for that. There can't be. Democracy, like everything else in the world, has the defects of its virtues. Look at us Americans right now. Oh, but here you are waking up, I think. You did see what happened to countries who did not wake up in time. These countries are certainly not entitled to give you lessons. But unfortunately, they are a lesson in themselves. 
We've heard it said over here that France really went into the war unwillingly and almost expecting to be beaten right from the start. No, I think this is a profoundly untrue and unjust statement. I watched the French mobilization in 1939. I was in France. Five million Frenchmen went to war once more without one word of complaint. They were determined to defend bravely their country. But when the German attack was launched, the French found out, found out that they had nothing with which to fight. No tanks, no planes, no munitions. The first defeat came, then came discouragement, then capitulation. And some who call themselves Americans say that France fell because she was a democracy and because democracy does not work in a crisis. I know. That is a statement that I fight with the utmost energy. France was not beaten because she was free. She was beaten because she was weak. It seems to me very ungrateful to forget that in 1918, under the leadership of such men as Clemenceau and Foch, a democratic France, with the help of England and of the American democracy, won a war over a tremendously powerful and militaristic Germany. In other words, there is nothing wrong with liberty, but liberty is beaten when she has no weapons, no defense. If you had to put in one sentence the reasons for the French defeat, what would you say, Miss Curie? I would say material and moral weakness due to lack of preparedness, of leadership, and of unity. And I would also say loneliness. Loneliness? What do you mean? I mean that, by what you might call an accident of geography, France was the first line of defense against Germany. Had she been able to resist, England was saved, and America would have been spared all her present worries. But between the two wars, neither England nor America understood in time the necessity of a strong France and of an effective solidarity with my country. Finally, the suicidal policy of isolation, so popular in America and even in England, contaminated France too. Our thinking, in turn, became selfish and purely defensive. The Maginot Line spirit was born, and because of this spirit, we lost many of the potential friendships that we still had left. When the Czechs, the Romanians, and all our friends in Eastern Europe saw the Maginot Line being built and realized that France's policy would be to fight behind it, what hope could they have of French aid in time of peril? Little hope indeed. So, why should they remain our friends? To Americans, that's one straight from the horse's mouth. There are a good many of us, far too many, who look on the Atlantic Ocean as our Maginot line and are quite content to sit behind it and wait, no matter what happens to our friends. I know. We did just the same thing for several years. Fourteen nations in Europe, enslaved today, have discovered one after the other that to concentrate on defense and to abandon your potential allies does not in the least keep a country from getting into a war. It merely leads the country to fight finally the war on her own soil behind ineffective Maginot lines or Maginot oceans and to fight it alone. Now, the sit-and-wait policy has certainly not proved to be a success so far, in no instance, nor even work and wait. Not quite a success, no. And this ought perhaps to make us revise some of our ideas about democracy. We have asserted too often lately that a purely defensive spirit was the only answer to aggression. We have gone so far as to identify the love of peace, which is a natural and noble feeling, with an ideological pacifism amounting to a moral capitulation and to a refusal to defend our finest ideals. A French writer recently said that pacifism was not a part of democracy, but only her parasite. I think he was right. Did your American ancestors, Mr. Stout, and did my French ancestors sit and wait while they, bit up, while they built up our democracies and conquered the freedoms that we have enjoyed in our generation? Certainly not. It is thanks to their militant spirit that democracy has been created both in America and in France. This militant spirit remains a necessity today. Democracy will not survive unless free men and women are willing to fight for it and to die for it. When necessity demands that. But did our countries educate their citizens to face that necessity? Ah, yes, did they? In the French schools and also, I think, in the American schools and colleges, we have taught the children about their rights, we have provided them with an accumulation of knowledge, but did we prepare them for duty, for obligation, for sacrifice? I'm not so sure. There are two concepts 
which had been too rarely used in our schools as well as in our books and in our newspapers. One is patriotism, the other is civic responsibility. I agree. But to go back to what is happening in France today, you said you've been reading quite a number of letters from your compatriots. Yes. In fact, I had a definite purpose. I wanted to gather the most representative of these letters from France in a book called They Speak for a Nation, which will shortly be published here. How about giving us a preview? What do they think? Well, the French put all their hopes in a British victory, except for the small group which advocates a friendship and an alliance with Germany. The nation as a whole absolutely refuses to collaborate with the Nazis. Well, how do the French feel today about totalitarianism? My answer is probably going to shock you. The French are by nature for democracy. They are therefore against totalitarianism. But in our present misfortune, these ideological words have given way to much more simple and instinctive feelings. The enemy is on the soil of France. At all costs, he must be removed. It is as plain as that. And this idea of liberating France has become a rallying point for all Frenchmen. We come back to what we were discussing a few minutes ago, to the rebirth of a direct patriotism above political parties and political quarrels. What about General de Gaulle? Are the French people today pretty enthusiastic about him? Many French are. I would say millions are. For them, General de Gaulle is a symbol of the resistance to Germany and of the faithfulness to the Franco-British alliance. Imagine that in practically every little souvenir shop or bazaar in the occupied or unoccupied zone, our compatriots can buy, more or less openly, little Croix de Lorraine, the Croix de Lorraine being the emblem of the de Gaulle forces. What does the de Gaulle movement amount to outside of France, numerically? I believe that the free French forces fighting outside France number something over 50,000 soldiers. Besides this, General de Gaulle controlled, as you know, the free French colonies in Africa, five times bigger than France itself, with a population of over six million people. And what about the de Gaulle movement politically? Is it right or left? On the right of what? On the left of what? France is enslaved, Mr. Stout. Our political parties are no more because our freedom is no more. The unity that we did not achieve in time before the war, this very unity that you have such difficulties in achieving here in America, is slowly becoming a reality in France. Everybody has lost everything. Everybody is hungry and miserable. Everybody is against the conquerors who occupy the land. This is a cruel way of unifying a nation, but it is a way. I hope the American unity will be achieved under different and more happy conditions, achieved now. As for the soldiers of the free French forces, they are the servants of the French nation, not her masters. They are recruited among all parties. I think, and I hope, that they have even forgotten to which party they used to belong, right or left. And we might say that they are sworn enemies of Hitler, which is a political attitude in itself. It certainly is. Or let us say, in a more positive and constructive way, that the free French are the allies of the liberal regime of England and the friends of the American democracy. This again is a political program in itself. The free French are fighting for a victory which will be and must be for every nation involved, including France, the victory of freedom. Your freedom and ours, your Bastille Day and our Independence Day. Thank you, Miss Curie. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is Eve Curie. This is Rex Stout saying goodbye until next week.